Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this RegamerTo.com video, we're going to be discussing AMD's Computex conference. That's a bit of a weird sentence, isn't it? As you can probably imagine, there were two products which really the gamers were most interested in, and that is both the Vega architecture, specifically the RX Vega, and also the Threadripper range of CPUs. So we're going to be starting things out with Vega first, because we have a release window for RX Vega, not the uh, Vega Frontier Edition, along with some demonstrations that AMD once again showed us regarding uh, Vega. And then we're going to move on to loads of information regarding Threadripper, because they were a lot more boisterous, to be quite honest with you, showing off Threadripper than what they were with RX Vega, which is a bit of a shame, but it is what it is. So first things first, they did indeed give us a demo of the RX Vega, and it was showing Prey. Now I have a couple of issues with this demo. The first is that they were using two Vegas graphics cards, uh, two RX Vegas, along with Threadripper, and the biggest issue, as you can probably imagine, is that there was no frame rate counter. Now, it was running at 4K at ultra settings, and all of that's really nice and everything like that, but because there's no frame rate counter at all, what the performance was like, we just do not know. And, you know, you can get a GTX 1080 tire, which can run very high at, like, you know, 4K at around the, uh, let's say, the mid-80 frames per second mark, obviously depends upon your CPU and what version of the tire you've purchased, that type of stuff. But, generally speaking, it is very capable. A standard vanilla 1080 is probably going to get more along the lines of just about 60 FPS, which is still pretty respectful. But, let's be honest, without a frame rate counter, Vega didn't exactly set a light to stage, because ultimately that doesn't really tell us anything. I would love to have seen the frame rate counter and along with just a single card because that would give us much better indication of performance. And I also would like to have seen a wider gamut of games. Quite frankly, one game is not enough to sell me on performance of a card. Yes, of course, they did show the normal stuff where we saw, you know, high-end rendering stuff for Blender. We'll get into that later on when we're talking about um, Fred Ripper more. But ultimately, in terms of GPU stuff, it was very much kind of roll out the same tech demos that we've seen a few, a few other times. And in terms of gaming, at least, there wasn't really that many demonstrations on performance. I do have a feeling some of this might be down to the fact that their drivers are still not optimized. They still feel that there's probably some room left in the tank. And we also don't know the state of the RX Vega Silicon. There are some rumors that they had, well, not even rumors, Raja Kodori has said that, you know, there are some additional features for RX Vega. I've kind of done some speculation and made some assumptions based upon some of the various patents that AMD have had recently that some of this could be down to, like, advanced boosting on the graphics card and some other bits and pieces which specifically would be for games, but ultimately we just don't know yet. However, what we do know more about is the release date. So... When can you go ahead and pick one of these up? Well, AMD have officially confirmed it's going to be launching at SIGGRAPH 2017. For those who don't know, if you don't have it marked in your calendar, that's the 30th of July, which is around a month later than the Radeon Vega Frontier Edition, which launches next month on the 27th of June. So we don't exactly have an exact release date, but this basically means pretty much end of July, very early August, we're probably going to see them filtering onto store shelves. I do have a couple of questions regarding that. Predominantly, the pricing uh, question pops up as well as availability. If this thing, if, let's be just silly for a second, let's say it outperforms the GTX 1080 tie by 70%, and it costs £10, just for the sake of argument, that doesn't make a blind bit of difference if you can't walk into a shop and buy the damn thing. So really, availability is what really comes down to the uh, final, you know, the final piece of the puzzle. And the reason I'm bringing this up about the availability question is really it comes down to HBM2 memory. This is assuming that Vega is only HBM2 based. We, we have no... Uh, evidence to the contrary, so I'm going to make the assumption that all Vega cards are um, HBM2 based, but, you know, we all just have to wait and see, and if it is HBM2, we all know about the issues with production of HBM2 memory, 
which SK Hynix and other manufacturers have kind of said about, including AMD themselves. Uh, NVIDIA have mentioned it a couple of times over. So this obviously is really impacting the availability of the cards and possibly might also impact the sheer number of cards available for launch. And a basic thing of economics is supply and demand. If you are requiring 10,000 shipments a month, I'm just throwing that off the top of my head, but there are only 8,000 of a particular product to make those 10,000, then obviously cost is just going to go up. And unfortunately, we as consumers may have to pay the price. But obviously, let's not count our chickens and all of that stuff. So, I guess the most logical thing to follow that up with is the X399 platform, which I still think is a bizarre name, considering the X299 from Intel obviously is just launching... I do wonder if AMD have chosen that deliberately, and by wonder, I wouldn't be surprised at all. So, what have we learned? Well, for anyone wondering if we're going to see a bump in the number of cores available to, let's say, or I don't know, just throwing out that 18, or perhaps 20 or 24, no. Um, this is not something AMD are looking to do at the moment, at least according to this conference. They are not looking to outcore Intel. Obviously, we've heard that Intel are putting out a monstrous 18-core 36-thread part for X299. I do feel that Intel kind of rushed that. I don't feel that it was something that they kind of planned on early. After all, a lot of their early documentation was really focused even up to 12 cores. So... It feels like they, they just added this 18th core in there just to say that AMD didn't have the core count advantage. That doesn't really mean anything. You know, if, if Intel can manufacture it and it, you know, has pretty decent yields and there's not issues with the CPU, then that's all great with me. I have no problems. Anyway, so what do we learn? What have we learned rather from this particular conference regarding Ryzen? Well, good news and also some bad news. Now, the good news is we did get some solid information about some of the specifications. Once again, AMD reinforced the fact it supports quad-channel DDR4 memory. It is on the X399 platform. And obviously, up to 16 cores, 32 threads. That wording obviously does indicate that there are going to be a multitude of different SKUs going up and down the gamut of pricing and performance. Perhaps the biggest... Um, I wouldn't say upset, but certainly one thing that did cause my eyebrow to tweak a little bit was the fact that they have 64 PCIe 3.0 lanes in this particular um, in this particular CPU, and that's a very impressive indeed. Another really nice thing regarding Threadripper is that unlike Intel, which have been kind of weird actually with how it's decided to pair up and uh, and uh, segment how it's handling the various CPUs and I.O. regarding its own platform. For example, KB Lake X and Sky Lake X, you've got some which feature 44 PCIe lanes, others which feel, uh, feature, excuse me, just 28, others which feature 16, uh, the i7 and the i5s. In other words, the KB Lakes just feature 16, the 7800 and 7820 feature 28. It's a bit messy, and quite frankly, I don't really like it. It does mean that you're essentially being penalised if you are going for the one of the lower-end chips and want a multi-GPU configuration, and or a lot of I.O. overhead as well. The other issue with Intel's particular segmentation is that the lower-end chips don't also have support for full quad-channel memory, and that also is a bit of a shame, to be honest with you, and definitely would have helped to, I guess, act as a bit of a, a buffer and really help to push the X299 platform above, let's say, the, the, the standard KB lakes of the world. That would be quite nice, the Z270s, I guess. So, Definitely the extra I.O. is going to be kind of handy. Obviously, that's not to say that Threadripper is going to outperform. Let's say if you've only got a single graphics card, you're just playing games, and maybe gaming is one of your one of your remits, but you also decide to do a lot of uh, CPU-intensive workloads, like a lot of virtual machine work, that type of bits and pieces, then that could be kind of handy. Do remember, and this is quite interesting, first of all, AMD did show a demonstration uh, once again, showing Blender and how, you know, four, I just want to repeat that, four uh, Vega Frontier Edition cards was just absolutely snappy with 64 threads 
um, sorry, 32 threads available thanks to Threadripper. That was great. But also, it does remind me of the recent update that Robert Halleck has posted regarding Ryzen and uh, Agasa 10.06, where they're re referring to, you know, the ability to have extended support for PCIe Express, uh, sorry, PCI Express Access Control Services, also known as ACS. This allows man manual assignment of various uh, graphics cards within various containers. In other words, what you can have is various GPUs segmenting and putting themselves just available to a single virtual machine. So, for example, if you are creating a high-end rendering type of rig, you could have one virtual machine which would have full access to, let's say, one or two Vega cards, another virtual machine which would have access to another Vega card, and so on and so on. You could even potentially have one VM which would have full access to, let's say, one Vega, and then you could just have that for gaming for, let's say, you know, your partner, while the other three Vega cards, in theory, could be available for you for, let's say, Blender work, which would be kind of cool if it works like that. We're going to have to wait and see what type of scenarios and how flexible it really is, but it does sound pretty awesome indeed. We're not going to know about that because Agassa is going to start releasing for standard Ryzen platforms, such as the B350, X370, over um, the next couple of months. Really, there's only one other question a lot of folks have, price and availability. Well, price, mm, no one knows. I'm going to make the assumption and say that the X399 motherboards are going to be more expensive. How much more expensive? I don't know. It could be that the basic um, X399 board is about as expensive as, let's say, a high-end uh, X370 board. It could be that you know there is not much difference in pricing in the end, which I highly doubt, because obviously you did have the extra I.O., you've got the additional PCIe slots, you've got the, the you know the memory and all that stuff, so it's definitely going to be more expensive. In terms of availability, AMD is still being somewhat cagey. They've just said some point in the summer. Once again, summer is pretty lengthy. Obviously, we're pretty much in uh, kind of entering the beginning of summer now. So really, we could be probably seeing the next couple of months. It wouldn't surprise me if it's within spitting distance of RX Vega. Finally, and I suppose this is about the least surprising news ever, <laughs> to be honest, and that is that Threadripper is not compatible with Epic. For those who do not know, Epic is basically the server technology, and it is using the same technology. It's using a very... It's basically a cut-down derivative, if you will. And despite the pin count being identical, and the socket being extremely similar, you can't just plonk in an Epic CPU into a Threadripper or vice versa. So that's very important if you do so, you know, I guess technically I've seen people do some really bloody bizarre things. I've seen people put in CPUs in the wrong way. We've all seen the horror stories of people bloody putting um, thermal paste on the CPU pins rather than the top of the CPU. I don't know how people have managed that, but they've done it. And I've even heard people uh, managing to jam in RAM the wrong way, and that's very impressive. So I wouldn't be surprised if someone somewhere did manage to somehow put a Threadripper CPU inside of Epic. I wouldn't also be surprised, although obviously I don't know this for certain, if certain custom BIOSes were released by hackers and possibly some, um, some uh, I guess the best way of describing it would be a converter, which would allow a um, Epic CPU to function in an X399 board. But obviously it depends, like, whether that would even be theoretically possible. By the time you've done all of that, by the time you've got the converter, done the BIOS, it might just be cheaper just to simply buy a basic Epic motherboard. But I guess we're just going to have to wait and see. So, I'm probably going to be doing a more in-depth analysis of the CPUs uh, against one another. That would be AMD and Intel, because it does have some interesting uh, usage scenario questions. And I definitely feel that right now people are, kind of figuring which to jump on. After all, it's fair to say that if you were in the market for Ryzen 
let's say the one of the high end Ryzen's, let's say the 1700X or whatever, I still feel as a slight caveat that the 1700 is the better value out of the Ryzen 7's, simply because most of them do overclock about the same, but that's a slight aside. If you are looking at one of those platforms, then you might be thinking, hmm, well maybe I'll just go for the low end Threadrippers, but obviously if you need to wait a couple of extra months is a bit of a question. Regarding Vegas performance, I do feel it's a little frustrating at this point. We don't have any solid information regarding performance at all. The only wording we've even had from AMD is that it's quite nice, and that was a leak, and AMD do not feel too comfortable actually discussing that, trust me. That um, obviously that wasn't exactly a leak, it was um, a statement, and then they seem rather cagey about discussing that further, trust me on this. That AMD, um, sorry, that uh, Vega is quite nice up against the GTX 1080 Ti. And also following on from that, because the Frontier edition of Vega is probably going to be A, more expensive, and B, aimed at the professional market, um, by which I mean, you know, it's going to have certain drivers and all that stuff and may not have the clock speeds of RX Vega, who knows? I would probably suggest you don't buy it if gaming is your, you know, your thing. So basically, there's a lot of questions for from AMD user for AMD users at the moment. It's kind of frustrating, but it is what it is. So yeah, it's exciting. It's cool. I'm very much looking forward to seeing what Threadripper can do. I, I do definitely feel it's going to have usage scenario benefits, especially when it comes to pricing. After all, we know that the 7980XE, which is a bloody unwieldy name at best, cost around two thousand US dollars. This is according to Intel. Ow, by the way. So even if you say that this particular CPU cost, I don't know, by, by which I mean a high-end Ryzen, let's say the 16 core cost, you know, 1200 US dollars or even a thousand US dollars if they can manufacture it at that price, it's quite interesting. As a very, very, very final thought, and I've said this before in a couple of videos, which is one of the reasons I'm just tacking it onto the end. Do remember, Epic is essentially using the same block as, um, as Threadripper in a CPU block. So in theory, at least, it wouldn't be out of the question for them to release a CPU which offers even more cores. So we could even see like a 24 core CPU from AMD if they wanted to. Whether they could actually fit that, whether they could put it on the same boards in terms of TDP and power consumption and whether they'd even want to because it might just be cost prohibitive. Well, we're just gonna have to wait and see, unfortunately. But with all that said, hopefully you have enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon, take care. Bye for now.